Guys, we've made it to unit two and I'm super, super pumped because um, we are starting our literary analysis unit and it is my favorite and I love the novel um, that we are reading and then there were none by Agatha Christie um, if you haven't figured it out it is a murder mystery um, novel and it part of what makes it so exciting is this buildup of, ex of, of, of suspense um, we don't know what's going on we don't know um, uh, who done it so to speak so um, I want to give a little bit of contextual background before we jump into our kind of uh, discussion of chapters one through four so our novel was written by Agatha Christie there she is little Aggie right there um, and she is an English um, novel writer short story writer playwright um, she is probably one of the most popular female British authors to come out of the 20th century, mainly because of her, um, I mean, all of her writing, um, is, is, uh, murder mystery. Um, if you've ever seen, um, Pierrot or, um, Murder on the Orient Express, um, The Pale Horse, I know that Amazon did, um, a kind of mini series, uh, earlier this year on um, The Pale Horse, which is a really good novel. Um, anyways, she was born <laughs> before 1900. She was born in the end of the 19th century um, in 1890. And she was born in Devon. Yes, I know. It's a beautiful name, beautiful place. Um, Devon, England. And uh, happenstancely, is that a word? I know happenstance is, but anyways, as a matter of happenstance, our novel takes place in the same part of England that she was born. And most of, a lot of her novels focus on um, the Devon uh, kind of coast area. So um, she is one of the best selling novelists of all time. And I, I think that um, if I remember reading something somewhere where it said that um, next to the Bible and Shakespeare, um, she has, uh, her novels have, have, have been comparable into, um, how many of her works have been sold. And I think she may have surpassed Shakespeare, um, in the 20th century. So she's incredibly popular. Um, she is often referred to as the queen of mystery. And um, her most famous novels are Murder on the Orient Express and the novel that we are reading, and then there were none. And um, I think that I read an article too that, and then there were none is probably one of the most loved pieces of uh, murder mystery fiction from uh, the last century. So I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. Um, a little bit of our historical context. Our story um, takes place in 1939, Devon, England. Um, and England is a little coast town in the southern part of England. It's sort of close to London, but um, it's not in the northern parts and southern part. Um, anyways, um, and 1939, of course, is post World War One. It's been um, a number of years since World War One, and we are on the cusp of World War II. Um, Britain in in 1939 is making preparations. Um, it's in, it's evacuating their children and all that kind of stuff um, to prepare for um, an imminent war with Germany. So um, why do I tell you this? Why, why, why mention this? Well, because um, at this in this time, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of kind of paranoia and, and um, instability, both in um, both economically, um, culturally. Um, what's the other word I'm looking for? Socially. Um, uh, and because of that instability, um, the, when you have an unstable society um, or one who is on the brink of a war, there's that kind of heightened sense of fear, of dread. And this is a, I mean, that kind of mirrors the psychological um uh, I mean, it gives us kind of a psychological 
look into our, our characters because uh, they are filled with the same kind of dread for, you know, other imposing reasons. So, um, there's, like I said, this kind of level of uncertainty and, um, it, the 1930s and the 1940s really kind of represent, um, a time of transition in the social hierarchy in, um, England. Why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and it's kind of the loss of the old kind of Victorian, um, mindset and we're moving into a time of modernity um, particularly, like I said, with social hierarchies, um, these kind of rigid structures previously are kind of becoming more loose. And um, if you look at um, women, and we will because one of our main characters, Vera Claythorne, um, is kind of that new modern woman who's juxtaposed to the old kind of traditional um, English um, woman. So um, understanding this is kind of important to, um, our novel. Um, our point of view, which is really interesting, um, and note, I've taken all of these pictures from the kind of new, uh, mini series that they did for this, uh, book. Um, please do not watch it because it is different. It will screw you up and mess you up. It's not the same. Um, our point of view, um, it is third person and it's, it's kind of complicated. It's, it's not something that you can really put your finger on because it's both omniscient yet limited. And we come to know everything at the end. Um, but throughout the novel, we are very limited in the knowledge that we have, which is kind of mirrored to the knowledge that our characters have. They are stuck kind of in the dark and they are only privileged to um, what they are told. And we are only privileged to what we are told. And um, in some regards, we are privileged to the thoughts, the individual thoughts of each character. And the longer the novel goes on, um, and the fewer people we have to deal with, we get to know more about our core um, group of characters through their own inner thoughts. And that kind of gives us an insight into their kind of psychology, but also into their backstories. Um, but in some regards, uh, we're meant to kind of question this idea or concept of truth. Are they lying to us through their own, because they're lying to themselves? Um, and we also want to look at what they think versus what they tell each other. And of course, um, there's that kind of question of honesty in what they tell the various people um, in their company. And right off the bat, um, uh, William Bloor, Detective Sergeant Bloor, or Mr. Davis, it's all, I mean, he, he lies to um, everybody around him about who he really is. And in, in a lot of regards, these people are brought together on this false pretense. So um, this kind of question of truth and honesty um, is very much um, kind of something that you guys wanna watch for in our novel because it's one of our themes. Um, and speaking of themes, I wanna talk a little bit about the things that I want you guys to kind of keep an eye on as we read um, through this story. Um, social order is important, justice, judgment, um, responsibility, um, the inevitability of death, and also that kind of unifying um, uh, kind of concept of death, isolation, both physically and emotionally, um, lies and deceit, guilt and blame, memory and the past, um, mortality, um, and also in some regards, morality, um, respect and reputation, dehumanization, that's a big one. Um, the role of women, particularly if we look at, um, well, we have three women, um, two we really get to know, um, three women, Vera and Emily Brent, and they're 
um, kind of these stereotypical uh, women, and they're really kind of juxtaposed to each other. Um, and um, not only um, the, 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 their role and their presentation in the novel, but also how they are perceived by um, the various men um, around them. Um, appearance versus reality, this idea of truth, like I said, um, this concept of interior versus exterior, um, and that goes both physically and emotionally. Um, the kind of interior of the place of the mansion versus the exterior of everything that's going on in the natural world and also the kind of interior of a character um, emotionally psychologically versus their physical exterior or um, like I said the kind of appearance versus reality the presentation or the performance they play um, for the outside um, for the benefit of everyone else. Um, so having said that, um, I'm going to stop our little video here. I'm, I'm going to pick up with, um, the first four chapters of our novel. So stay tuned. <laughs>